So, uh, you wanted me to talk about the album? <laughs> what does the album mean to me? <laughs> <laughs> Have a good heart. For us to go from two EPs that we've self-released and self-funded to then release an album that has somehow been picked up. Oh well. This has been the fastest year of my life, I think, because it feels like the album came out like three or four months ago at most. Uh, singing the shower, that's about it, you know. To have an album that got us signed, playing not just one but two festivals in America is kind of crazy. I mean, I don't think anyone from Shrewsbury could anticipate that. By the end of the first listen, I was like so blown away that I was like, I think we need to put this out. Like go from the process of recording to the album coming out the year since, it's been like a couple of years of like mass transformation for me. There's things on the first two EPs I'm like not too happy about, but I still, a year later, somehow revisit the album and I don't hate it, which is which is nice. That's progress, I think. When I listen to the songs, it kind of speaks to me on like a personal level. It probably does for a lot of people. Just the opportunities it's given us and stuff, it's just, I mean, I think way beyond what we personally thought it was going to be when recording it, so. So it was really cool to see somebody who I had known as a fan and a friend be a part of something that I felt was such a huge step forward as a musician. And so, um, yeah, it was a no brainer for us. As soon as we had a couple listens to the album, we wanted to make an offer on it and put it out on the label. Yeah, it's a losing school. Glad to have such talented friends. Yeah. So. Oh. <laughs> there. there you go. There you go. When we were in the studio, we recorded pretty much everything. like 400 gigabyte of foot just sat on my PC for like almost two years at this point. That makes a noise and ruins the recording. I'll kill you. So we're going through the excruciating task of trying to turn that into something that you can watch. Hard sell, but well, <laughs> it's the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. So. That's good, that. We first worked with Sam on our song, Eat For High Fiber, um, a year before that. We literally spent one day together and he just like smashed it and we had so much fun and it just made that song so much better than we thought it could be. And so we just knew he was the right guy for the album. You throw Johnny in the mix. It's crazy. Mix. I was so surprised when we walked through the doors because like I vaguely remembered what Sam looked like because I hadn't seen him for like a year. And then Johnny just comes in and like extends his hand out to me and I was like, it looks really different. <laughs> yeah. Fun fact, fun fact on meeting Johnny for the first time, it was the classic, one person goes for a fist bump, other person goes for a handshake, and I was like, well, it's already awkward now, so, you yeah. know, we'll just touch hands. May as well just pack up and leave at that point. Yeah. yeah. Just scrap the album. We start recording our debut album tomorrow. I think I'm ready, but I'm also shitting it. <laughs> I, would, I would like it to be good. I think that would be ideal. Some days I think it's really good, uh, and then other days I think that it's it's not very good. <laughs> it's... Try and hold that back a bit. Maybe if I try hard enough, my lungs will begin to swell. Out through my nose and back again, breathing slowly till I learn to let this go. This song. I wrote like way back in, I want to say 2018, pretty much the first song I think I wrote after the first EP, but it was like extremely different back then. Maybe if I try hard enough. I'm pretty sure there's only two lyrics out of the entire song that stayed. Maybe if I try hard enough, because that was like the running title I had back then. And if I'm anything but honest, that is it. That's the year. No. <laughs> <laughs> First ever 
um, re noted documentation of uh, of that song. How do you how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> was it the first song we recorded in the studio? I think it was. I think so. Yeah, because like whichever ones I could smash out quickest. And I think that we did that in like a couple of hours. <laughs> Also, a testament to how the track listing of the album was as well. Yeah, because we knew we were going to do the transition into Peter Keen, and I think that's why it was the opener. Mm. We recorded them like back to back, because I remember for ages, we literally just had those two songs as one thing. We recorded some demos at home, mm. and we took it in, and then decided to actually speed it up in the studio, which is funny, because a lot of the stuff we listen to now we think is too slow. Fun fact about this song, it sounds like a synth, like a little synth line following the solo. It's really quiet. If you really listen to it, you'll hear it. But it was just my voice, and then Sam just turned it into like a synth line. <laughs> like Ew. Ghost, isn't it? Huge shout out to Sam Bloor for just being a great producer, mm -hmm. among many other things, uh, because there's so much stuff that just like isn't thought about or just completely changes in the studio. I just remember the fresh in the morning, he's like, I had this idea when I was just like just at home last night. 24 7 producer. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and, and he's just constantly thinking of harmonies as well. Yeah. yeah. Like before we'd even done vocals, he was singing harmonies along to the demos and yeah. stuff. He just doesn't stop. You're showing off there. <laughs> the intro to the song, like the acoustic and, and vocals, that starts the whole album, we didn't record until like, I want to say the second to last day. Yeah, because we did it like drums all in like the first two or three days. Yeah. We split up guitar and bass. We didn't do any vocals at all in the first week. We did like a week, five days later we did two days, and then there was the weekend, and then there was the final week. Because this session's been spread out over a few weeks, I feel like this is uh, this is like all I do now. I'm just expecting to see you next week, the week after. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be so sad. This is what we do, the, in the infinite album. Yeah. <laughs> it just keeps going. And I'm pretty sure we didn't do any vocals until the final week. Which was also kind of stupid of us to have a show in the middle of recording an album. <laughs> yeah. It was just approaching December, and of course, because it was winter and it was so cold, I think I was on the verge of getting sick the entire time. So recording all the vocals in one week was like a lot. Into the booth. <laughs> Shit. Don't look! <laughs> Wrong words. No, yeah. no. And that's something I will think about in the future. Especially at like nine o'clock in the morning as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just, Christ. Just the amount of like honey and like <laughs> lemon and ginger tea we went through. A lot of cups of tea. Yeah. Just from being tea. slightly ill, fucking our voices. Take it as it comes until it's gone! Can we swear? Yeah. It's too late. It's too late. Like. <laughs> <laughs> It was rough. There's still some takes on the album like I wasn't totally happy with when we got to the end of it, but like I think all things considered, it was okay. It's apparently done the job. It's apparently done the job. It's apparently done the job. Like I remember Calm Before the Storm, we did that last. We just had to repeat that like the last <laughs> chorus, oh, like yeah. over Sometimes. and over. <laughs> There's no oh, fucking way. That, 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 that long ain't happen, is it? It got to the point where like I was moving my mouth and nothing was coming out. <laughs> <laughs> It was very cold in that live room. I think as you're listening to that, 
I'm wearing an Udi and slippers. So. Yeah, there's probably a lot of questionable clothing. I, I was, in I was that vocal booth. Yeah, a lot of the time I was under a Santa duvet. Yeah. On the sofa, yeah. It was probably one of the like most fun two weeks ever, though. Waking up in the studio, being silly as soon as we wake up. <laughs> I do. Be funny. <laughs> you. Yo! And, and yeah, I'm until like, like 2 a.m. every night as well. You gotta do clap. Clap! Make it sexy. <laughs> What's going on here? Year 9. I'm trying to work here marking your exams. You think this is funny? Oh. Mr. Yeah. Smith, is it? It's good. It's good. It's Do you think it's funny? Look at me. This is all acceptable, year nine. Do you know how much I get paid an hour? Not much, probably. But it's not relevant. Not much. Not much. No. Nah, no, shouldn't really I'm be practically discussing I'm practically raising you whilst your parents are working. Mummy. <laughs> Sorry, So much of, like, between work and stuff, you don't really see as much as each other. Me walking in at 9am, and Brody's still asleep on the sofa. <laughs> it was annoying at the time, but it's funny thinking back on it. Jack, how did you sleep? <laughs> Ready to rock. The last lyric is breathing slowly till I learn to let this go. And that was just never meant to be the name of the album when we went in. Mm. We just didn't have a name for a long time. It was like staring us in the face the whole time. Like this repeated lyric at the end of the first track that we listened to so many times and it just kind of made sense. And I can't imagine it being called anything else now. Yeah, the last couple of years, for sure, I've become a di completely different person. Like, I've gone through quite a lot, and a lot of that album, I feel like, is is written about change and, like, accepting it, which is why the, the album title works so well, because you just got to learn to let go of your past, you know? I'm just glad to have been able to work on it, to be honest. Next song on the album is Peter Keen Avril Lavigne, which is the main single. I had like the main melody for so long and just had no idea how to progress it. I can't do much to give up Sometimes it's best not to force something. If you start writing something you like and then just write a proper dud of a chorus or, or whatever. Uh, so I'm really glad we sat on that for a while. But one thing that I think really lifted up the chorus in that is the little lead guitar thing that kind of follows the vocal melody, which I can't take credit for whatsoever. I'd spent ages recording guitar and I went to the shop around the corner to go get a drink. The co-op's sick. And I came back and I was walking up this lane that the, the studio's on. Lower and I lane. could just... Lower lane and I could just hear this this single guitar line just like echoing out from really far away. And I came back in and Sam was layering it and it just added so much. And I wish I could play it live at the same time. There's a lot we can accredit Sam to. And it was just coming up with just even little things like that. The drum fill in that, that brings the song back in was actually oh. Callum and Brody's idea. <laughs> I was just a bit grumpy that day, maybe. <laughs> and so I bullied Jack into playing a different drum beat. Jack just looked like, like a slight look of fear at me. <laughs> and I'm like, no, do it now. Pam and Brody are like trying to give me directions using their mouths as drums. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to explain drums when you're not physically behind the kit. Yeah, just just do the just do just do that. Yeah, it's difficult. Mm, yeah, but well worth it. With both EPs, you'd say things like, you know, you didn't feel confident enough playing through the whole song to be able to experiment more with fills. What we kind of did with the album is a lot of the songs were written months before we went into the studio. Like, we haven't got the money 
to book loads of studio time and just do like a Beatles and just kind of spend three weeks noodling and you know writing as we're there it's like everything had to be ready to fully utilize the time we had um, and I, I really think the album was the first time like we had the songs down so far in, a, in advance that we could really experiment with mm -hmm. yeah bring in put in like yeah. a bunch of cool drum fills and stuff It's Rebel of the Face White. Hello, me, old. Rebel of the East, your old pairs of boxes. Cringe. Where do you even get that face white from then? Um, would you like to know, weather boy? <laughs> what strings you got, Carl? Um, Amazon Basic. I fell asleep with the TV on. Recently, I stay up way too long. So the next song on the album is Junk Sleep, probably the oldest song on the album. It was written in a similar time to Maybe, if I try hard enough. Uh, it's like right after the first EP. You spend like a week with your friends doing stuff you love. It's like, it was that post-studio blues. So I wrote this pretty sad and quite powerful song. Like I think I remember playing it to Jack, like we were having a band practice after recording and I played it to Jack. Um, before Cal had arrived and he was like, oh my God, you've got to play out for Cal when he gets here. <laughs> it's my favorite song, the music video, like, it's just cool. And it it takes me back to recording when it was just a few months after it, even like from then I like teared up watching it for the first time. Like, oh, that was such a good time. And I feel like I get that whenever we're in the studio together, I get that kind of n sort of nervous energy from all of us. We're all hyper to be around each other. Hey Jack, listen up, Cal's got something to say. Yeah, that was 2018 and we held on to that for ages. Like we were going to put it on close for season, but we just kind of weren't prepared enough with the studio time. Like we only had a couple of days to record the drums for that and it just wasn't really ready. But I'm quite glad it wasn't ready. Yeah. It's a lot of people's favorite on the album, I think. Or yeah. one of their favorites. It's definitely your favorite, It's right? my favorite by a mile, but no, you know, that's nothing on the other songs. It's just most like the type of music I enjoy, I guess. I think if it was on the last EP, we wouldn't have got your your shouty vocals on it. No, it is just sort of the only time I've felt really con confident enough and like comfortable enough to actually like give singing a, a go, really, on this album. Second EP we recorded in isolation from each other. When you have a producer there as well, giving extra ideas and giving you like the positive reinforcement to get involved and add these extra layers of vocals and stuff is so much different. Because we were in lockdown, not having the producer there made it a lot tougher than it should have been. But with the experience we had with Sam when we recording Eat Four, I mean, it was just a sort of a blessing really that he's just so talented and just so good at the whole aspect of making music. It made things just 10 times easier. And uh, you feel a lot more confident when you're just in a vocal booth and other people outside the studio can't hear you. Uh, but when you're in home and you know there's people on the other side of walls and stuff, it's it's hard to add all those things. I can't afford a life anymore. In fact, I can hardly do it. I think vocally, recording some of them was kind of difficult, like junk sleep. That's like a raw, emotional song. I'm trying to get out some of these kind of hard-hitting lines over and over again until you get the right takes. That's kind of difficult, I think, having, you know, my best friends around to kind of fall back on and and just have some some time to have fun and chill and just hang out after it really helps. So One thing I remember about recording the intros of that that you'll see in the music video, when I was recording the vocals at the start, 
uh, we actually put the microphone outside the vocal booth to give this kind of slightly echo, more echoey sound. And it was so cold <laughs> that by the end of doing that take, I couldn't feel my toes. <laughs> like, I literally had to put my feet on the radiator <laughs> in the control room. So it was so cold. Um, I feel like that kind of fits the vibe of that song though. It's like yeah. a cold, yeah. you know. It's got a lot of winter aesthetics. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I always see it as like splitting up the album a bit. Mm. <laughs> bit of a breather, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit of a breather and it kind of changes the vibe a bit. I, I think it's still kind of a, a bit of a deep cut on the album. Like we've never played it live, uh, yeah. but there are some people who say it's one of their favorites, which is cool because I think Sam really, really elevated that song. <laughs> Maybe a bit of a longer slide though would be useful at the end. Yeah. Because it's different. Nice. Stops it from being the same predictable stop every time. Yeah. Just gives it that little flavor. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure that snare was about right, but I think it will be. We'll check it like. Post Credits Life was written probably about six months before we recorded the album. The, the intro kind of came from, I demoed the song and I was showing it to Jack and I accidentally scrubbed backwards and it played the intro riff backwards, which we found quite funny <laughs> at the time because we have terrible sense of humor. And the way it built up and had that little ramp up into the song actually sounded really cool. Mm. So we suggested the idea to Sam in the studio. Must have only been sat there for like 10, 15 minutes. Mm. And he just turned it, this single guitar line into this huge atmospheric, just spacey yeah, intro. Yeah, that, that guy went, I'm pulling up the, the big guns for this one. I'm hungry again, man. Yeah. This is silly. That one. Well, that's not a cry at all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I like that. That's how much John Soup is. And then something yeah. just has that cut off at the end. Yeah. I think having this build is a really nice way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. so. Testament to the genius of Sam Bloor. Shout out. Yeah, we... Big Bloor sound. Big Bloor sound. Big Bloor sound. Check your tuning. Yeah. Yeah, check your tuning. All that experimental guitar thing was done when I was doing percussion because I wasn't there for that. I came down and I was like, <laughs> What the hell's happened to <laughs> this song? <laughs> we were full Angels and Airways on that. We did. Crazy. Yeah, I like it a lot. I sort of, on that very last time as well, want like a, I think it sound cool with another vocal going like, don't, uh, don't forget, don't forget, over the top of it sort of thing. Don't forget what I said. Power ballad epic song. It's about me falling in love and um, my wonderful partner, and it's things like that you're putting a lot of heart and soul into in a good way. Dream of You was one of those where, like, you come to us with the songs, 
straight away I'm like, yeah, that's on it. Goosebumps. Sometimes I start crying. The best feeling is when I'll play a new song for these guys and it's just like a instant, that's, that's it. That's made the cut of whatever we're working on. The best part of the song's already done, bro. No. Nah. Dream of You, one of my favorites on the album, and it only took me like 20 minutes to write it. That's a fun fact for you there. Mm. That's a big flex, that is. I don't know what it was. It was just like, I don't know, it all just kind of fell together, which is crazy because like, I don't think I can write another song <laughs> like that now, like as much as I'd love to, because I really like that song. It'd be difficult for me to recreate that now. Trigger warning, Weezer. It's very like Pinkerton, I'd say. <laughs> Remember in the studio, it's very like Hangy Moon by Dirty Nell. It's just got that very like spacey, epic, power chord, sort of power, whatever behind it. That takes going in. Oh shit. It kind of also felt a little bit like the spiritual successor to Eat Floor, which we'd recorded with Sam before. There's kind of elements of that song in there, especially the outro. Mm where it just has this more like chill kind of outro and it suddenly all comes in. Mm. It makes me think of Up In The Air as well a bit. Like it's a nice song about love. <laughs> yeah, came from similar places, so it makes sense. When, 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 when you sleep, do you dream of me? That sort of two part harmony we do on the verse is like one of my favorite bits of, of our music, I think. Yeah, I, I love that you've really stepped up with the harmonies in with like the last album and things. Everyone was kind of like surprised that um, I could hit the notes that I hit on that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I even I would surprise myself. I love playing this and Junk Sleep the most because I get to do that and, you know, if it's a good day. It sounds really good. Yeah, it's cool. There's our little rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. You have to get him like a coaster that says rocker on it for his desk. You'll have to put like um, a new on video from the 80s. I spent a lot of time when we've been playing live, you know, giving it a go, like giving singing a go while we're playing. <laughs> wanted to kind of make a bit more of a mark on the, on the actual album coming out um, than I did on the previous EPs in terms of vocally. This is the end of side A, isn't it, as well? Yeah, um, there's actually like... <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say? Because it's actually the end of side A that we snuck in this little Easter egg. Because at the end, we actually snuck in this little voice <laughs> that actually... It says to turn it over. I remember it's, that. Because it's like... <laughs> I remember that. So, because it's actually at the end... <laughs> There's this little Easter egg at the end because it's obviously side A, you flip to side B on a record. We snuck this little voice line in that um, if you hear really close up, you might have to have headphones or like really good speakers where it just goes, please turn me over. <laughs> it's quite hard to hear because like all the, like, the noise and the craziness. <laughs> but it's in there, I promise you. I'm not joking. <laughs> Roll BT. <laughs> Tell us about your head. 
Oh shit, yeah. The head incident. Um, we'd finished recording drums. I was literally on the last song. I got up, like picked up my drumsticks, and like as I stood back up, bashed my head on like the wooden diffusion panel. For those musicians out there and the producers. And just hearing the smack and the instant recoil. Like I felt secondhand pain from that. Yeah, that shit hurt. <laughs> I, I didn't think much of it at the time. I actually went to go and get some food, like something to eat, found a bathroom somewhere. And then I looked in the mirror and my head was just bleeding, like like coming down my face. He just doesn't come back for like <laughs> two or three hours. And I was like, oh shit. That's a bit bad, isn't it? Next thing we know, he comes back in just with a sandwich in hand, uneaten. Where have you been? Went to the uh, doctors up the road. The doctors? Yeah. Why? Well, I didn't realize this, but I hit my head when I was what? coming out. By the time I got to the hospital, they just said <laughs> it's already healed. So I wasted about five hours waiting in this waiting room. Yeah. So I went there and they were like, it uh, looks fine. Just get some paracetamol. You probably see it on that. I spent like 20, 25 quid on Ubers getting there and back. We just cracked on and at some point Sam was like, is he, is he actually okay? And we weren't really sure, but... It was just ridiculous and unnecessary. I went from one hospital, they said, this is like a major injuries unit. Like you need to go to the other hospital, which is the other end of Stoke. I went from one hospital to another hospital for the other hospital to just say, yeah, you're fine, like it's healed now, just go. And I was like, oh, I don't need like stitches or anything. They were like, nah, just leave it alone. And I was like, doesn't need cleaning or anything. They were like, nah, you'll be fine. So I wasted about five or six hours and 25 quid. Everyone laughed at me. <laughs> so. There you go. That's the head injury. I said I wouldn't write a song about this year But I feel like I became a brand new person It's not a person So we start side B with Brand New Person um, which is the song that Sam almost completely ruined for us. really annoying because it actually made the song like 10 times better talking about dream of you being the epic if we left that in there and if if guns and roses was so kind to lend us the melody <laughs> we would have had losing score epic number two in the same album as try as we might mm. um slash would just not let us use the riff so <laughs> disagree on like a huge amount of stuff when it came to um, like adjustments to the mixes after but one thing that Jack was not on board for <laughs> for so long in Brand New Person was like the big mm. Yeah I thought it sounded too much like a football chant and <laughs> I, I, it made me hate it Yeah. and since doing it live like I don't mind it now now that we've played it so much but for ages I was like oh, just can't like enjoy it <laughs> because I'm like thinking it sounds like I'm at a football match. Have you been to I'm a football glad, match? Yeah, once. Yeah, they played brand new person. It was a bad experience. <laughs> and I'm I'm glad that we kept it in now. We like made a bunch of versions where we kept turning it down mm. um, to see it like which level it was 
not too in your face, but still in there because most people we showed it to like friends were into it mm. i'm glad that it's in there now by the time yeah i hated it mm-hmm. <laughs> i'm glad we're a three-piece because i feel like bands of like five or six members must have this all the time mm. well like mm-hmm. a couple people won't like it and the rest well it's difficult i don't think we have that many disagreements when it comes to stuff like that we're yeah. pretty quick to kind of come up with a solution mm-hmm. as well but there's a period of like a week and a half when we're doing the mix revisions where we all just fucking hate each other <laughs> because we're like I want this well I want this it's, it's difficult like, mm. doing song revisions sucks because like you're just all making big lists and then trying to make a compromise on something mm. um, but when you listen to like the first mix versus the last mix it really is you know there it's is a different there's a, such yeah. a noticeable difference yeah it's one of those which i've come to really love playing live to start with i didn't really like playing it and now i'm like it's one of my favorite songs to play just even just from the ending <laughs> oh, no. i'm not a very good lead guitarist but we wanted to put like the solo in the song <laughs> And so I literally wrote the solo note by note in a notepad. There was like no level of, oh, I'll just like fiddle, fiddle around and, and, you know, whichever take sounds the best, we'll use that. It was like calculated every single bit. <laughs> Is that too much? It's okay. I, I can, oh, I try it. See if, see if it's doable for me, but... <laughs> really yeah. Okay, that was great. It was so cool. It it wasn't until the final night of tour I played the whole solo without messing one of the notes up. And during the solo, I stepped on my tuna pedal. <laughs> it cut out, and I was like, one time. That was fate kicking in, that was. It was. into a one for fruit, I feel like. <laughs> Papyrus Pyramid was written a couple years before the other songs, um, literally just as like a quick clip. Um, I think I did the first verse and then the chorus and then had no idea what else to do. Originally I wrote like a second verse, but then it just seemed like um, it was cool just to kind of change it up a little bit and have this instrumental, which I think we quite like playing live. This was wrote more than just a couple of years in the other songs, wasn't it, really? Yes. Um, while the like the chorus, the lyrics in the chorus, I wrote when I was like fourteen, mm. which is crazy. I used to when we were in school. Um, I really hated just like concentrating, <laughs> like I probably should have. And so whenever I saw like a scrap of paper or whatever, I'd take it, fold it up, put it in my pocket, and just like write ideas and stuff or, or doodles. It's probably here somewhere. This little piece of paper that said, "And I always knew." Uh, that's when I was playing around with the the guitar idea, and I was like, I'm gonna use those lyrics. That at that point were five years old, now like eight years old, mm. which is crazy. Um, so shout out to 14 year old me for collabing with 24 year old me. Oh my god, 10 that's years. That's freaky, right? But yeah, before recording, but like during the writing process, where I had to fight my battle with Jack about keeping the final chorus. 
Because mm. at first, I liked the idea, like, in concept, it was cool that the instrumental would build up and then just end before the final chorus. So, like, we have that cool little build-up riff right at the end and then it just stops and it's the next song. Uh, but we just didn't have the next song that would fit, really. I, I think that's just the whole music writing process and track listening process as you fall into what you're comfortable with doing. But with having, you know, not beat down, but, like, you know, <laughs> you chug, so yeah. to say, it does feel good to just smack the shit out of some strings and drums, I imagine, to finish <laughs> off a song. Yeah, that's fun to play right at the end. Mm. I love doing that live. I'm glad we kept it in because it sounds so much better. And like, yeah, it's just that feeling of like, the end of the song, the rhythm changes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I didn't have that, it would kind of be a bit boring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fun to change it up a little. God, that's what it is. That's a fun one. That's that's good. Good. that should be. It should be the last bass, eh? Well done. What? I'm taking the microphone. I'm taking the microphone. No way. Poor Johnny. Uh, we did a week with Johnny and he killed it doing, you know, we'd do like a, a take of drums on a song and Sam would send it over to Johnny and he'd be upstairs editing it and stuff to make sure it was ready to record guitar on after we'd done like the next song of drums and stuff. And it just made things so efficient and he's so great and so fast in the little break between the first week and the second batch of days. Yeah, he got COVID, so yeah. we just didn't see him again for the rest of it, which kind of sucks. In that in that first week, though, like, Sam would be doing guitars with you, and then I would go upstairs to record percussion with Johnny. It was just such a streamlined, like, production. Just turn this on, oh, capture yeah, some of the uh, golden moments. Hell yeah. I think we were just talking with Sam, and then we just heard, like, bongos and stuff going on <laughs> upstairs, and we all were just like, what the fuck is going on up there? Well, because Sam was like, hey, why don't you guys go and do some um, percussion and things upstairs for, like, a couple hours at, like, 9 a.m.? And it comes to the end of the day at, like, 5 or 6 p.m., <laughs> and we're all ready to, to leave. I mean, you just hear Jack upstairs just, like, <laughs> just making a new Crash Bandicoot soundtrack upstairs. Yeah. Do you want to know what time it is upstairs? Yeah. <laughs> Bongo hour, yeah. too, isn't it? If you just listen out for the percussion on the songs, like it could really change, you know, a whole section. Yeah. There's bits of like tambourine and like shakers in there. If they weren't there, like you don't realize how much it boosts like the song mm -hmm. just sure. having them in there definitely like even like quietly in the background it's just an extra layer johnny was so good at like trying to encourage me to like think outside the box with that sort of thing and like you know with the bongos and stuff like we added that onto um papi's pyramid because i was like well you know it's named after a crash bandicoot Try. <laughs> so I was crash like, Bandicoot vibe. Yeah, I was like, let's nail the Crash Bandicoot vibe. I just don't think we would have thought about doing any of that beforehand if no. we made this record just ourselves at home. So as you can tell, recording an album is quite expensive and with us not having proper jobs, big office jobs, the quickest resolve that we had for that was to film TikToks. I don't think it's the best marketing scheme, but you know. Wow, that sounds great. But you know what sounds even better? I'll tell you what sounds even better. Buying a Black Loser Score hoodie from our merch website before the pre-order runs out. The one of me dying, that was a classic one. Pre-order hoodies. What was that? Pre-order. <laughs> the one of me ripping off the whole Limmy Show point and sketch. <laughs> He's outside. Wait. Oh my god! <laughs> Alright, it's fine. Just a casual reminder. Loser Score Black Hoodies. Still on sale to this Sunday. I mean, the cinematic masterpiece is, I think, Christopher Nolan, you know, really took inspiration for it. And Sam, the producer. Oh, yeah. What are you say? <sighs> well, come on. Spit out. <laughs> oh, 
Sam said if we don't sell enough black loose and score hoodies by Sunday, he's gonna delete the album. <laughs> We were in the upper nine mindset when recording those TikToks, you know. We're trying to get money for the album. Both me and Brody were doing video at it at the same time. Tapping away on Premiere Pro. I don't think it was ideal to be working and recording an album at the same time. But a hustle is a hustle. Two loaves of bread make a sandwich and that is the album at the end of the day, really. <laughs> Like that's our Foo Fighters song to bring in another <laughs> legacy band. Can I grumble? As a, a friend of my mum's would say. Can I grumble? And his last name, well, his full name was Paul Seaman. <laughs> Seaman and Garfunkel. <laughs> Still on there. <laughs> Bacon is the only other song on the album that's in drop D. Some of our previous songs we've done in different tunings, but for some reason on the album we just did like the whole thing in standard bar two songs. I don't think there's too much to say about Bacon apart from the fact it's another one where I was just sitting on a riff for ages and one day I was like, let's try and add lyrics. Um, and it's kind of written from like two different perspectives. I remember the first time I played it to Jack, you were like, I'm glad that ended there because <laughs> it didn't need to be any longer than that. It's like, apart from Crawl, in fact, I think it's exactly the same length as Crawl. So it's like the shortest song we've ever done. Mm. Yeah, it's rare to get a song with under three minutes, really, isn't it? Well, it used Maybe to be rare. Under four minutes. Yeah, it used to be super rare to get anything under four minutes. So like, to, for me to just suddenly be like cracking out these two minute songs was cool. And that's, Vacant is now like the least listened song on the album online. But uh, we played it on the release tour and I really like playing it. We haven't done it in quite a long time, but it's just like a fun little one mm. to play, I think. Even if it's like not one that people remember as much on the album. But, um, Brody, you have to make it awkward, don't you? Wait, hang on. Is it on the lyrics? I'll just have the lyrics up. You know that Which one's that? The Brody, you gotta change that. What? Ah, oh, fuck. Don't ask me if I'm fine. Hang on, hang on. Right, I think I've got it. Okay. Don't ask me. Cool. So Delightfully Devilish is what <laughs> Callum referred to in the studio as our Simpsons Hit and Run song. Oh yeah, I've got the photo I think on my uh, laptop. <laughs> <laughs> God, this is giving like a bar level at hit and run, but it also sounded like the Friends intro song. <laughs> oh shit! And so obviously the Friends clap is in that song. Are we gonna get sued for this one? No, <laughs> it's fine. Not a copyright clap. I'm willing to uh, risk the lawsuit. I don't yeah. think anybody's mentioned that to to any of us. Now you know. Now you know. The secret I, thing. I think it was. I think it was just like a subliminal thing <laughs> because. <laughs> For years, I've thought that Seven by Turnstile sounds like the Friends theme tune. <laughs> and, like, I was big into Friends at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was just like, just sounds like Friends, doesn't it? And then, and then we all just played it and then went... And, yeah, no one's really ever brought it up. But it is a very heavily inspired song by Friendship, so, you know. Yeah. Boom. What more, what more to then... Lay the foundations of the Friends wow. Club with, with a song about friendship. Yeah. Comes full circle. Exactly. <laughs> the, the song was written like super last minute because I sent the album worth of demos to my girlfriend and <laughs> I remember like, I'm going to be kind of crass here. I was sat on the toilet. <laughs> I got a text from my girlfriend. She just listened to the demos and she was like, yeah, it's really cool, but um, like on a serious note, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, 
that sort of made me think, wow, maybe this whole album is quite sad. So I just wrote a song about my friends mm. and it was kind of cheesy and kind of fun. And it had this riff that we weren't really sure if it should be high or low. <laughs> I think I wanted it to be low, Jan wanted it to be high, Sambler whacks out the uh, the octave pedal, mm. and there we go. Uh, history was maybe made. <laughs> Again, it turns it into like a completely different vibe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually got one of those pedals after. The Sub and Up pedals, not sponsored, but it's a good pedal. And like the first time we played Black Flick Devilish Live, I was like full of glee <laughs> playing that song and just being able to use that pedal for the one song and just hearing that riff sounding like it did on the album just brought me so much happiness. It was you nice. Never played it again. Never again. So there's this riff at the end that Sam played in it, mm. and I think he hid it in Dream of You as well. It was like the same riff, and it became a bit of a joke of like hiding this riff throughout the album. <laughs> And swipe his snot and then, yeah. snot oh. and then put, put it back up his sleeve. <laughs> it's like watching a peep show. <laughs> yeah, we're just in the studio, man, just doing some things. Oh. Wow, super noodles again. Life's relentless. Eat the super noodles. <laughs> Shit, the super noodles. <laughs> what was that, super hands? I can't, I can't do it, man, it's out of focus. Here, I'll fix it. <laughs> um, we're gonna have to do voiceover because yeah. I'm looking at Brody, but I'm not <laughs> oh, this is sad, man. Ew. Oh, uh. Brody, you do vocals, you idiot. <laughs> Why are you crying? I was choking on noodle. <laughs> I'm choking on this ratio. I feel less like the man every day. I think I'm losing myself in the words kind of way. I feel That's it. What are you getting? Now <laughs> <laughs> cut to me, we'll do an, no, cut to me, we'll do an office move. Alright, that's enough, that's enough. Turn it off. Turn the camera off. Turn the, turn the camera off. Get off. Get off. Um, year nine. <laughs> no, I hate it. I hate it. So Crawl, like Vacant, is of a much shorter song than anything we usually do. And I actually think the only reason it's as long as it is is because like the last 15 seconds is just fading out. And it was totally just a Joyce Manor song. I was like, I need to listen through Joyce Manor's discography to make sure I'm not <laughs> riffing them off here. <laughs> I really like playing it because I don't have to think much. I just play and it's like really simple. You just smash it out and then it's done in like probably like a minute when we play it live. <laughs> yeah, so. for sure. I think that one's become like a favorite among some fans, even though it's not like that popular online. Mm. There's some people who get excited when we play it. This next one's from your album. It's called Crawl. And we cut it off one of our set lists once and people were like, no, we saw Crawl on the set list and you didn't play it. I love on the studio version, just like the outro having these kind of 
layered octaves that Sam came up with that just <laughs> gave it this like My Chemical romance finish. Yeah, there's quite a few songs that sounded that and we were just like, oh shit. Yeah, that's cool. He's like, have you thought of doing this? We went to like, the Black Parade. Yeah. We kind of did. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like that? It's a bit of a callback to the other song we did. I like that little callback to the one you wrote and one of the other songs. You did that one, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So cool, that. Oh, yeah. Album. It's now a concert. <laughs> Sometimes these people are put in a pick scrape and they go like, yeah, so like, like shoot off the end. But that, like, it's just like literally, you just go like this. Like just, that, like two centimeters. They pick so, scrape in the air. And they just like, go straight off the end of the fretboard, like. <laughs> that is one I was really struggling on the vocals for at the end. Like, it just, th there's still a couple bits that I like wince out a little bit when I hear it, uh, because I was like, my voice was really struggling towards the end of the album. And I remember in post, like, we tried to tune it, and <laughs> he like, sounded like T Pain when he's got like I think loads of. probably put me on record of saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. so. A bit T Pain. A little T Pain. So we just kind of kept a, a bit more raw. And I think it supports it. That's think, my excuse. <laughs> yeah, just a, a good song. And like the way it ends as well. You have like the half time bit, and then you have it half time, but like quieter and nicer. Yeah. To like end it. And, and it kind of faded out into the start of Calm Before the Storm. Like the transition's very subtle you can't hear it. I think that was nice to kind of have this quite fast, energetic song just sort of slow down and crumble into this really nice soft ending that started into the last track, which has like an, like how the album started, just like an acoustic guitar and vocals. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy because none of us listen to Oasis, but this is just, you know, such an Oasis track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember when we were practicing this, um, Callum kind of ruined it for Brody, I think, a bit. <laughs> yeah, much like Sam hit us with the Sweet Child of Mine, Brody would start playing it and I would just start going, I would like to leave this <laughs> city. city. <laughs> and then that just sort of like made Brody hate us for a bit. Yeah. Yeah, as yeah, much as bit. you know, as much as we praise Brody when he writes a good song, we do, <laughs> you know it's just quite horrible how we treat you really. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, yeah. I'm going solo next year, so it's okay. But that's fine, um, we kicked you ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it just like completely shifts though halfway through, which yeah. I think saved me from the Oasis criticism. <laughs> because it's like, oh, that's not yeah. nice, that sounds, but it's just kind of a bit isolated. Yeah, yeah, really, really tall on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, the whole end of the song was so different, and I kind of hated it. Maybe the good times are now, after all. Maybe this is just the calm before the storm. Day feels like another charm. I sit by and let the hours tick and fade away. And when I'm old and gray, I'll miss these days. You know, I was like, maybe we'll try something different for the end. And then Jack came up with a melody for a different song. Um, I've got a little idea. Um, 
for the lyrics, everything's going to change, so don't focus on them too much, but the melody is what I really want. I was just sort of um, writing for my own, like, sanity. <laughs> and I had a keyboard and I was just, like, noodling on it. Everyone I wanna talk to is already out with friends. I don't know. It's kind of cheesy, but basically the melody was just ripped straight out of my hands and uh, <laughs> Brody's taking the credit. Yeah, much <sighs> like Oasis, Oasis, Guns N' Roses, you're on the list. Yeah, there, right? well, you, know, list. you just made the list. <laughs> but, so. Roll VT. Roll VT. Roll VT. Roll VT. Thanks. This is Jack's melody now. I don't know any the words. So I'm just gonna sing random words on top so it sounds good. This is Jack's melody right now that he wrote on the keyboard. I think it's literally good now. I think it's really, really good. And we'd some more think back to those years when we were so young. Everything felt up to misty when it all goes so wrong. There's times where I kind of forget that Oh, that's the bit I wrote. It, it really fit in there so well. I had this little chord progression I kind of wanted to use at the end. And I was like, I'm going to go to Jack's idea for like, see if this melody fits. And it was just straight away. It just like fit perfectly like it was meant to be there the whole time. And I got so excited. I was like, this works so well. <laughs> and then we just had this really stupid idea of ending the song by making it faster and faster <laughs> and faster. Yeah, the original plan was to have blast beats at the very end, just, you know, the DIY scene, just love randomly chuck it in blast beats whenever yeah. it's not necessary. And I think you almost passed out. Yeah. The one, mm. one of the times we actually tried it. <laughs> That's still gonna work in the yeah. studio. Yeah, we still did it though. Like, it still gets faster. Uh, I, I, I can't tell if I want to go, uh, like, uh... Or, like, go back into the sort of normal, like... Sam was very clever with giving us a set BPM and being like, yeah, slow down after that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> The big long note at the end of the song I did in two takes and it's not perfect but the first take I did it right at the end of singing all the lyrics before it just in like one big chunk and then I hit the long note and I'd been singing for so long without taking like a proper deep breath that I almost passed out in the booth. <laughs> fucking passed out. I felt my vocal cords move in a way I've never felt before. My, I think my brain was like, do note, and lung, my lungs just, the, yeah, it sounded like, maybe we'll just punch in just you doing the note, and so we did it one take, and he was like, that was it, mm. so. Um, it was one of those where me and Callum looked at each other while you were doing it, and we just went. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that was the moment I passed out as well. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone stood up and clapped and cheered. Yeah. And then they all passed yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, it was quite impressive to like hear that happen. Is that it? Woo! <laughs> yes. So obviously, the end of Calm Before the Storm, we all got around a microphone together in a big live room and we did the, the group vocals together. Mm -hmm. And I think we did the group vocals for all the album in that, that yeah, one room um, at the same time. One 30, 40 minute session, wasn't it? Yeah. Really? All right. Well, tonight, thank God it's there. <laughs> Awesome, man. Oh, 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 outside your window. My son, my love, my friends. <laughs> you can't floss whilst we're doing this. Anyone would care. It's a bit like the Adele, <laughs> the TikTok where we're going. Anyone would care. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
can't believe Brody Clark provides his hands that time. Huh? Can't believe you. <laughs> Just look up ahead before you crash. Yeah. That one was for the big man, uh, Southgate, really brought the lads in for the oh, World okay. Cup. But, um, just his fault, we lost really. Whoa! I'm gonna piss myself. Ah! Yeah, I thought I missed the breath of that last one, so I was like. He looked at me and I started <laughs> trying to stop laughing. I was like, ah! I can rip one out for the boy, man. <laughs> Come for the storm, like the album was the final thing we did. And um, and then we we ended it with just the end of the album where we're clapping and chatting. Yeah, and was that a last minute idea or did we just? I think I had the idea in my head. I was like, well, didn't it be nice and cute if we did that? But mm. I was like a little bit like everyone's gonna think this is really cringe. No, I think it worked. I like had the camera on behind us and I was like, this is gonna be such a nice special moment to catch her on camera. And then I turned around and the battery had run out. I was like, oh. It was definitely one of those where my mouth was moving, nothing was coming out. And then I just gave up by the yeah. end because we had to repeat it like yeah, like 15 or 16 times or something. There's no oh. fucking way. That's a half How long that ain't happening, is it? I There's no far, way. Though. A lot of words in such a small... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's just like literally my throat I could I felt it close up and nothing was coming out after that. The last few takes of it, mm. I my voice was just not in it. It yeah. was just you two, like I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Me not you know, doing many harmonies and stuff live. When it comes to the rare time I'll do it during a session of recording. I think I almost puked. I'm just not used to it at all. It, hearing you it. sing, like when Jack couldn't sing anymore and I yeah. could like properly hear you, it's really weird because you never really sing like on... Yeah, anything. it happened in the first EP when we were doing vocals, you can probably see me gag. I'm like melon be smelling. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I can't sing, I'll puke, it's disgusting. I think it was a nice way to end the album. Yeah, and, very nice. Yeah. Album's done, Jack. What? Album's done. <laughs> <laughs> I am I know. I'm just kidding. It's Dr. Michael Morbius at your service. It's so good, man. That is just classic dry low. It's so good, man. Morbius gonna be so good. <sighs> <sighs> Jack, what's going on, man? What's the problem? Look, Carl, I'm just really upset. I really, really want someone to sign the losing score. Like, I really, really wish someone would sign the losing score. So bad. I wish someone would sign the losing score. I wish someone would sign the losing score. Ah, uh, well, good try. Uh, maybe next time. Yeah. Hey guys, I, I just got this text. Oh. Well, what does it say? I mean, yeah? Yeah, why not? We got the final mixes and masses of the album i want to say just after christmas or the start of january mm -hmm. before we recorded the album i, I spoke to jake solzer from caranture of records i had known of the band for so long everybody seemed to be interested in the label and the bands that i was working with and so i just known them as friends um for a while before that i asked if you wanted to hear the album as a, a demos or if you want to just wait until the final product was out uh, i sent it over as soon as we got like the masters like hey check this out we're really proud of it uh, just thinking maybe i'll have some feedback for us typically when i have a relationship with somebody like that where it's like we're friends because they like the bands on the label when they send me their band for the most part it's like oh yeah i want to uh give it a listen and hopefully enjoy it, but usually it's not really resulting in something that 
we want to release on our record label. But when Brody sent me this record, I think by the end of the first listen, I was like so blown away that I was like, I think we need to put this out. Uh, literally two days later, he sent us, uh, he was like, what's your email? And sent an offer. As I was reading that email, there was a flag behind my my <laughs> PC of current two of records and like so many of our favorite albums and, and bands have, have been on that label. And when we first started playing music together, we would cover like mom jeans and stuff. We were in college, like watching YouTube videos. We'd just see all these like live sessions of like mom mm. jeans, Prince Daddy, yeah. graduating life, stuff like that. Yeah. And it was just like, oh my God, it would be such a dream to like do that. It still hasn't really sunk in that, that we're on that record label that we like no, really, really dreamed about. Just to be part of that team is really sick like even if this is the only thing we ever do with current you if it's like we've been part of that history you know they recently celebrated 100 releases and our albums on in that yeah with all the albums that i was on there it's a bit like fuck it, nice. yeah it's cool it's uh it's nice to be part of that history and um jake and the, the team at current you have been uh so nice and accommodating and they took a huge risk on us, like yeah. pressing 500 copies of our album. And shout out to Dexter as well, who runs operations over here in the UK. Like he's just, he's not our band manager, but mm. he's helped so much with, with trying to reach out to people about shows and helping us with the release and stuff. It's been really sick. Um, and the whole team are really lovely. I mean, having Dexter from Care Intuitive sort of given us a kick up the arse into actually getting us into gear of how to be a band was pretty good we needed that i wrote a list in my mind of like cool we'll send it to current intuitive records when when they don't sign us we'll send it to these people <laughs> just the fact that that list just literally didn't get past the first name on there was mm. absolutely wild and i'll forever be grateful for that I remember Brody being very it's very cryptic when it comes to these like <laughs> special things like if we've had shows where we're like very excited to play with bands and Brody knows first we just get a cryptic email being like, guys, I need you to all get on a phone call right now. Yeah. And it's just like, what you've done now? What's going on? When we signed the contract, I think we were all playing Fortnite together. Yeah, I think it was Fortnite. Yeah. <laughs> when isn't it some dumb game? <laughs> Why does it work? Oh, no. <laughs> we said it's a Jake. <laughs> It, it, we just went through the, the motions of just recording an album and not really expecting anything. And then, yeah, this record label that we've always wanted to be on, and it was like our first choice and debut album on that label. Everything we did before that was just us, mm. with like the first EPs and singles and things. And we were ready to do everything ourselves for the album as well. Um, it was just a case of like if somewhere, you know, a label that we, we love and respect want to release it, then we'll we'll talk about it and we're just lucky that that happened. It's been great to see the reception that it's already gotten and then now the band's got a ton of cool stuff coming up with their first US tour and I feel like it's a, an awesome time to be a losing score fan. Do you know this is a sincere um, kind of, you know, offer from from actually like mm. the music and believing in us as a band rather than just seeing money <laughs> because yeah. there's no money in the losing score let me tell you that yeah. is there not for you Colin. Oh, shout out to skullduggery in Shrewsbury, um, yeah. where we shot the album cover, and to Sarah Maiden for doing the photography. I'm pretty sure Callum was just like, why don't we just make the album cover us cutting Jack's hair? Yeah, I think that was, so the way we discuss ideas is at 3am on a voice chat, and I think it got to the point where I was like, Jack's got long hair. <laughs> why don't we just shave Jack's head? And then Brody drew the little doodle. Two days later, I got my hair. No, it wasn't even cut. two days later. It was, it was like, like the next day, day after. So only one person's allowed long hair in the band. Because the original idea was to have the back art as like just Jack's hair on the floor. Mm. But just for God's sake, a picture of the hair on the floor. <laughs> so. he, he was like, guys, I got my hair cut. And so like, did you get a picture? What picture? Yeah. So. Yeah, I kind of dropped the ball on that one. But also, it's kind of weird to ask. Can I take a picture <laughs> of my hair on the floor? Yeah, yeah. That's true, actually, yeah. But I just thought it was, like, um, I kind of symbolic. 
You learn to let it go. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's been a big transformation since recording the album, even more so since releasing it. I came out of a long-term relationship. I cut my hair, which grew over COVID. We had all just gone through a pandemic, and every time we had a conversation about naming the album, I just thought it naturally binds to all of our lives, as well as mine personally. All the songs in the album are about introspection, realizing things about ourselves, laying all the negativity out on the table and realizing if you want peace with yourself, you just have to let it go. That first song and that last line really sums all of that up. Nice. One thing about being on a label is that they know a lot more than you do when you're just doing everything yourself as kids. One thing they asked us to do was to make a video for Spotify, uh, which, as you know, is probably the biggest music streaming service in the world. The video is basically a plea to, to convince them to help us with the release of the album and potentially put some of our songs on some of their playlists. Hey, we're the losing score from Shrewsbury. We're an alt rock three piece band. Check out, look, the music video. Wow, we do fun stuff like that. Cool. In summer 2018, we recorded our debut EP. We didn't expect many people to hear it other than our friends and family, but with Spotify's help, we reach people all over the world from Norway to Kazakhstan to Italy to Mexico. Since then, our music just kept reaching new highs. I mean, look at these, the numbers speak for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> With the help of the Discover Weekly playlist, 150,000 people have listened to our own music and then further added it to 13,000 more playlists of their own. Whoa! Four out of five of our top cities are in the US and we've never even been. Oh. And thanks to everyone who discovered us on Spotify, we managed to deliver merch across the world. Whoa! Uh, I don't think we ended up on any playlists. So, <laughs> you don't ask, you don't get. Sometimes you do ask and you don't get either. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing. I think Peachy Keen was actually like <laughs> combining multiple ideas, just like they do in the music video, or we do, I guess. I really think that's probably our artistic peak. <laughs> With some some funding from the label, we hired a camera and bought a bunch of stupid props and things for, for the Peach Keen video. Oh, oh, it's just sad now. We spent a couple of weeks just asking around our town, places like that would have us to record a video. That was a bit stressful. I remember one day I just started going around places being like, can we film a music video here? Like loads of places were like, here's our email we won't get back to you. <laughs> like, this is a classic experience. We're filming Peachy Keen Avril Lavigne. She used to be coffee house. Shout out. Shout out to Max. Uh, Raven Art Studios, we filmed the whole like painting scene in there, so that was really cool. You're making a music video, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The concept is they're really bad at, at it, and I've done it perfectly, but All it's right. just a printed picture. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can stop laughing because Cal, like, <laughs> Cal was behind the canvas and then he just came out and was like... Uh, Stratonia Boxing Club. It was so funny going there and like explaining to somebody who is like so enthusiastic about boxing that we're basically just going to do an American wrestling parody. <laughs> it's kind of difficult. That was fun. That was really fun just, uh, just throwing each other around the ring. Do you smell? <laughs> Just look at me, we fear in your fist. Oh. Gonna be like airplane when he's like sweating. The place was flooding at the time, like it was raining so bad that literally there was pools of water all along outside the ring. So like basically the wrestling ring 
was one of the only places where it was safe to stand <laughs> uh, without being immersed in water. Yeah, the places that we that did have us, we were really grateful for. Like our friend Max, like filmed the action shots for that. That was all done in the Shrewsbury Coffee House. Shout out to everybody who helped us make that and all the places that let us film there. So it's so stupid, but I love it. <laughs> I'm not drinking it! <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite things is uh, Callum wearing a magician's costume, throwing cards around and pulling a rabbit out of the hat in my garden. That was that was something special. <laughs> Don't film that. Can we can we cut the cameras please guys? Can we cut the cameras? No, can we cut can we cut that? Cut that. Cut that. Cut that. Cut that. Can we cut that? Made a music video for Delightfully Devilish, like months after the album came out. <laughs> We've been on the album release tour and just had so much footage of us having fun. Oopsie! I love unwrapping young men. <laughs> That's what he says. Really, you really are living the rock. She might get the she might get the mystery prize though, Aaron. You fucking losers. Oh, Graham's outside. I think it's brought us closer to the Ibis budget franchise. Let's go. Too many times we've had to not look in the shower people as much as we've had to fight back the urge to look in the people. Why is the mirror? Why is the mirror what? <laughs> <laughs> You're actually in a the tour wasn't very long, but it was really exhausting because uh, we didn't have a driver. So we did almost all of it on public transport. We were on trains, buses, we had some lifts from friends. It really feels like a community moment in this car. <laughs> <laughs> we were just carrying so much shit across city centres. One of the most tiring things I've done in my life. For the next tour, we had a driver. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> no. Business school, please. Uh, so it's closed. Really closed. Yeah, I've had a really good time touring it, to be honest. It's been fun playing with the set list, changing around songs that we've been playing for years and seeing people's reaction to the songs that we do play and like, you know, PG Keen and, and Junk Sleep, like they already know the words. <laughs> Hearing that was wild because, like I said, that song's been sitting on the shelf since 2018 and to just suddenly hear people singing those words back to us was like huge. Seeing that sort of instant reaction and like hype around the songs that we like playing from the album is, is so sick. These words mean different things to everyone and suddenly you're there in a room where you're like, well maybe we'll be able to pull like 10 people um, including some friends with just like a room of people actually singing along to songs that have barely been out, which is really cool. Playing new places like Sheffield and going up to Scotland and stuff has been quite a good experience for us and just a learning experience in, in ourselves, I think, individually. We've played gigs since and have people that we don't know, we've never met before, come up to us and like tell us their favourite songs and stuff. It's, it's crazy. There's only so many gestures I can do. Yeah, yeah. I love playing gigs. It's one of my favourite parts of doing this. I get that nervous, like, excitement. The same one that we get in the studio, but, like, on stage. Getting to do an international tour is something that most bands never get to do and hopefully will be memories that last a lifetime. So whether it's the only one the band ever does or the first of many, it should be an amazing experience. And I'm super proud of the guys for taking the chance to uh, hop on a plane and play some music for 
for people across the world. So congratulations on a year of an awesome album. Thank you for letting us be a part of it. And I hope uh, this documentary turns out to be pretty cool. We're going to America later this year. It's just going to be like more and more milestones. But it was really easy to like just be like, okay, well, what do we do now? Mm. Like, we release this album on our favorite label. What do now? Yeah, it's the, the Spaceman thing of like, they've been to space. <laughs> now what? Mm. It's, I'd say it's like on similar levels as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, think of all the stuff we've done since. We've played like some really cool shows. We've played places that we'd never previously played, like Glasgow and like Dundee and London. Mm. And like, it's kind of nuts to just go places and people know of us. It's so rewarding to put so much time and effort into something that you kind of half expect that only a hundred people will listen to over the course of a year and suddenly the album does a lot better than you expect and people know the words. I'm excited to go to America. I'm excited to like just keep going. I'm excited for what's next. Excited that I get to work with such talented people. We're going to be playing Fest in Florida with a bunch of our favorite bands, you know, like the One Years and Prince Daddy and, and just the fact that we're able to take our music that far is something that I don't think we ever really expected. So no. I guess one last thing is um, just a huge thanks to everyone who has helped support us making this album, releasing this album, uh, just listening to this album. Uh, just huge thanks to all our friends and family and loved ones. And of course, Sam and Johnny for helping make it happen. Everyone out there who's listened, Jake and the crew at CI, you know, shout out. Thanks a lot. Buy the album, that's all I can say, really. You know. Catalyst, go. No. Thanks, everyone, for listening to us and supporting us and watching this documentary. That's hopefully not too long. Refunds available from point of purchase. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> that's what you're getting from me. I'm going. I <laughs> oh, see, this is... Breaking the illusion. <laughs>any of the names we kind of came up with. I have an album title that says Linus <laughs> Sex Tips. <laughs> I think we were getting slightly stressed about the fact we hadn't thought of anything through hours of playing Halo and trying to think of names. And so I came up with a list of actual ideas, such as exaggerate for effect. Nothing happened, but everything changed, which I still think was okay. Yeah, that sounds like a low song. song. Which Way Up? Who knows? Late to the Pity Party. Uh, revising the bucket list and then learn to let this go is at the bottom of that list. Uh, yeah. uh, Calum, would you like to read yours? Yes, so... <laughs> <laughs> Follow the theme of an ellipsis in the title, you've got... <laughs> <laughs> this is my favourite. You've got click, click, tunes. Spelled C H O O N S. I've got a kind of shit ones, really, but I've got honesty for apathy. That was all right. I'm going to skip some of these. <laughs> read them more like. Yeah. Even some of these for his yeah, shoegaze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, side projects in a few years. Respectful decline. I thought that one was right. The losing score solves the brown note crisis. <laughs> God, look at these. What's your right? right? <laughs> Never forget endurance. I feel like we couldn't get away with this next one. So you've got Good Morning Britain. <laughs> so it was some of Jack's. It was some of there Jack's. There we go. Album cover ideas we had. Uh, I get roasted for this on a like a daily basis. Um, dog eating a birthday cake in a birthday hat. And they, they roast me for this all the time. Yeah, it's good, um, it's good. The other one is sign flipping person getting a bit bloody sad holding a sign. Then the only other one on here is cutting Smithy's hair. That's my one. <laughs> that was my idea. Which one? Which and I have up. no idea. Yeah, one. literally has a bullet point with nothing underneath it. What happened was I saw Callum's suggestion of cutting my hair and I saw the album title and learned to let this go. And I was like, let's just fucking do that. Why are we even talking anymore? Um, happy birthday, learn to let this go. Happy birthday.
you're doing great. And if you're watching this on your birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Now we just need to get a picture of you with a dog, with a birthday cake and a hat on. And we'll put you in Klein makeup. Yeah. If, so if you go to the loonschool.com and con contact yeah, us through right. the email. I've got the masters, it's yeah, alright. I've got the masters for the album, so. Roll VT. <laughs> <laughs>